this is the NICU Lived Network, and we are your hosts. I'm Melinda. I'm Nat. And I'm Emma. We are all NICU mothers using our lived experience to partner with health professionals to impact research, advocacy, and clinical practice. Each week, we will bring you something new. It could be a topic highlight, the latest in research, a visit to a NICU, or ways in which you can use your lived experience within the NICU to impact change. We hope you enjoy this episode. Hello, and thank you for joining us on another episode of the NICU Live Network. Hi, Em. Hi, Nat. Hi, Mel. Hi, Grace. Hello. Yep, today Hello. we've got Dr. Grace Fitz-Allen, who's joining us. Hi, Grace. How are you? Hello. I'm well, thank you. Thank you very much for having me. I'm so excited to finally get a chance to talk to you all. <laughs> yeah, we've been trying to plan this for quite a while, which is fantastic. So for those of you that don't know um, Dr. Grace Fitzalan, Grace is a lecturer at the School of Psychological Sciences at the University of Tasmania. And she's also the secretary and the Tasmanian representative of the Long-Term Outcomes of High-Risk Baby Subcommittee of Pazance, which is the Perinatal Society of Australia. And we've spoken about that across quite a few episodes. Um, and Grace and I actually met in person the first time this year at Pazance in Melbourne, didn't we? <laughs> and we weren't we even did, part of the finally. <laughs> Yeah, because I've always communicated over email and we follow each other on Instagram. And it was just so funny how our eyes caught and go, hey, we know you. I know you. That's a person in real life. Cool. They have the rest of their body to yeah. <laughs> Fantastic. So Grace is going to be talking to us about her research project called Nurturing Chance. But before we get to that, why don't you tell us a little bit more about yourself? Absolutely. Thank you so much, hi. Melinda. Um, and hi to those who are watching. Um, so as Melinda graciously introduced me, I am Grace. I am a lecturer, lecturer down in Tasmania. So I grew up down here um, when I was younger and then moved to the mainland to Brisbane for study and then came back um, about two years ago now. So integrating back into the hometown um, and I, I guess outside of my work, which we'll get into in a little bit, um, I'm heavily involved in martial arts and a child development specialist um, in a child development centre. Um, and I've just taken up sewing. So everyone will be getting sewn presents <laughs> for Christmas um, this year. Some very eclectic interest there then, Grace. <laughs> yes, I try and do a broad and diverse <laughs> range of hobbies. <laughs> I love it. That's awesome. Um, so let's move on to um, Nurturing Chance. Do you want to explain a little bit about that? Yeah, absolutely. So Nurturing Chance was born out of my PhD project um, that I started in 2018. So it's a collection of three different studies um, that we developed with a focus on the long-term outcomes after preterm birth. So the first study we did was looking at the long-term neurodevelopment of children who are born preterm. And we tried to profile the different, I guess, co-occurring symptoms that children might have. So rather than looking at different difficulties in isolation, which is often done, or at a single age group or category of prematurity, we looked across the whole spectrum of prematurity and children from three to 18 years of age. So we really tried to expand um, the singular focus that we had seen in the research prior to that. Mm. The second study was, I guess, an unexpected study that came about from um, that original one, um, where we then focused on twin children because we got such an uptake of multiple birth families. So like, hey, we can, we can do something with this incidentally. So we had um, over 350 parents um, of twin children, um, and that wasn't including our triplets and more. And so then we looked at the neurodevelopmental difficulties, but we wanted to compare whether first-born children and second-born children were different in their experience of neurodevelopment. And then the third study, we really focused on the primary caregiver. So um, it, it happened that all of these primary caregivers were biological or birthing mothers that's how they identified mm -hmm. in the family um, but we we had opened it up to any um, family member in that primary care role 
And we really wanted to look at how parents felt in their confidence in their parenting role, given that there's often so many challenges um, personally with mental health, with child appointments, um, and looking at how that impacted how kind they were to themselves, or if they were really critical and saying, I don't feel like a good parent, I don't feel like I'm enough for my child, I need to be doing better, um, which is an indicator that we might be able to intervene um, and help parents feel empowered um, in their role. Mm -hmm. That's amazing. And where did the, and just from my perspective, where did you, where did the idea stem from to do this for your PhD? I guess what's mm. what's why this particular area of research for you? Absolutely, that's an excellent question. I had in the way the universe works, amazing opportunities open up. Um, and for my fourth year honors thesis, I had the opportunity to work with Associate Professor Samuel Dregup Dabora or Sam. Uh, and he is really heavily involved um, in the area of preterm birth and long-term follow-up more generally. And to be honest, before then, my experience and interaction with preterm birth and high-risk infants was quite low um, to the extent of I had seen it on Grey's Anatomy and I knew that it was an experience that was had, but I didn't actually know much about it until that year where I started to look at it with Sam. And from the moment I started reading about it, like I feel so strongly about this. Like I don't think that um, these families that have so much in their story are heard enough. Um, and I really wanted to play a role in giving a voice in some way, even if people don't read the papers, but doing my part in the capacity that I have to try and increase that visibility where possible. Um, and so that thesis looked at, it was a meta-analysis, and so we looked at already existing research on anxiety and depression for children born preterm. And that's where we kind of then extended to broader neurodevelopment. Um, and I really wanted to tap into that parental role um, a bit more. And so I imagine there's a huge amount of findings throughout, throughout you know, going through the thesis. Um, were there key findings that you came out from this? For those that haven't read your paper, um, were there key trends and findings that, that, that came through? Ooh, that's an excellent question. I'll try and be as short and succinct as possible. Um, and so I think a key finding from each of the three core studies. So for the profiling study, um, with we had 2,406 families involved. Um, with that study and we found that there is what's known as a preterm behavioural phenotype of this co-occurring difficulty for children. But we did find that the majority of the children had low severity difficulties. So while this is good for their experience um, in that they're not really severe and impacting all aspects of their life, it does mean that they're also under detected a lot of the time. Um, and that support isn't necessarily available um, or offered where it might be needed. So that kind of gave us a bit of a silver lining and that the children are predominantly doing well, but it gives us an area where we might need to do more work on mm. identifying all families and really taking an individualised approach to family and children. Um, the twin study, the key finding here was that second born twins, so the younger of the two or the one that was born second, um, had more severe difficulties across nearly all of the outcomes that we looked at. So we looked at 10 different outcomes associated with ADHD, autism spectrum disorder and anxiety, and nearly all of them were more severe for that second born child. At this stage, we're not entirely sure why that was. Generally, second-born infants have a greater risk of infant mortality and other conditions, um, but we weren't able to tap into whether that was the core reason for it. Um, and then for the parent study, we predominantly found that parents are doing quite well, um, but as time passes from the preterm birth event, they're doing a little bit better. Um, which is a positive thing, I think, for the potential that there may have been mental health support along the way or social support. 
um, but we're trying to tap into that a little bit more um, at the moment. It's a really interesting study. I've got one and we're he's nine. I'm sure Nat, have, we've got the same age boys. Um, mm -hmm. And we are seeing the impacts of having, I know that I am seeing the impacts of having a child that was premature. So, yeah, mm -hmm. some, of, some of the challenges that you've popped on there and not necessarily being across it as early as we could have been it is definitely an interesting area for me uh, now navigating it through. <laughs> It's very challenging, though, for the early detection. I know that mm -hmm. a lot of centres in a lot of countries, um, including Australia, the long-term follow-up isn't overly long um, and it does tend to drop off in that toddlerhood period. So a lot of families then feel like it, they're on their own and up to their own devices to do the surveying and doing the monitoring. Um, so you're not alone in that at all. <laughs> yeah. And I think on top as well, there is that, well, for us, there was this kind of like expectation or perception that, oh, you know, they're at that age now, it's, you know, that's that's done. You know, that's, mm -hmm. you know, that was their prem story, but, you know, we've moved on, but really it wasn't. It was just the beginning of something else. Um, and it, the twin study is interesting because I've definitely found the like I had twin boys, nine years old, and their, um, their long-term out, I mean, they were, um, had very different kind of trajectories in the NICU. One was one kind of struggled quite a bit, and one kind of did okay. But their long term trajectories now are very, very different. Um, oh, really? Yeah, really different. So it's really, I mean, they're, they're doing well, but just very different um, 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 journeys. But I'm, I'm, I'm curious and really quite impressed about how many um, families you're able to get involved mm. in the mm. PhD study, you know, for the first first study was like 2,000, 2,600 and the second one 300 and something like how did you recruit like how did you get that many families involved and how were they involved like was it meetings or surveys or interviews? Absolutely so I think this is the key part of um, I guess how my research has come about in that we had that parental uptake was incredible um, and it was far more than I ever dreamed I could get in these studies. Um, a lot of studies are within the couple of hundred, maybe, unless you have that really big countrywide approach where recruitment is at birth and follow up is, I guess, a cultural norm for supporting research in a country or in a state. Um, but the support networks that um, supported this research with the driving factors for it and word of mouth. So I remember I went into a presentation that I had for a requirement for my PhD to share it with the other um, students and faculty members. And I think I had a 180 participants and I was going in so chuffed because I had so many experiences captured. Um, and I remember it was the Neonatal Trust, which is now the Little Miracles Trust in New Zealand, they posted on their social media and I came out of that presentation with more than 500 participants when I checked. Wow. And I thought it was a glitch. I went in <laughs> and I checked, I checked with the, our IT support. I was like, some bots have gotten into my research. I don't know what to do. Um, but when I went onto Facebook to look at their posts, there were about 90 comments and there were questions and the engagement was just incredible. So from that, um, we were able to get more than 40 other parent support groups, um, including Melinda, um, including advocates and parent representatives to share the research around to families on their social media. Um, and that's really where it took off. And I had the highlight of my entire PhD would have been responding to messages from parents. Um, some asked to have meetings, um, irrespective of the research, just to have a chat. Wow. Um, so I loved that. Um, responding to comments on the posts on Facebook. Um, and that was truly the highlight um, for me because I got to do that interacting with families. In terms of what families did to be involved it was an online survey so i felt like from the design alone i missed out on that uh i guess person to person interaction um so mm -hmm. i really enjoyed that i then got to do that in another way even mm -hmm. if it wasn't 
a data collection method for the research itself. Amazing, huge interest. <laughs> yeah, clearly. It, I mean, it was incredible. Yeah. Um, and so was it national or international, your study? Like, because uh, initially I thought it was just Tasmania and then the way you were speaking, I was like, oh, maybe it was every state and territory or... So this one was, we had six countries. So we had Australia, oh New Zealand, um, Canada, the United States, um, United Kingdom and Ireland. So we had quite um, a spread. We tried mm -hmm. to choose these countries, even though they had differences in their maternal and neonatal follow-up, they were relatively similar, mm -hmm. um, more so than um, okay. developing countries or um, other nations where there's really big cultural differences. So we tried to find some similarities to get the expanse that we could. Um, mm -hmm. In our preliminary analyses, when we were looking at whether there were any differences, we didn't find significant differences for any of our outcomes based on the countries. So we decided to keep them together um, for our final analysis. That's amazing. And do you think, um, like, from that study, like, uh, sorry, like, is it has it evolved into something else now? Is that, like... I am in the process of trying to continue evolving it. Um, mm -hmm. I wasn't able to keep the name, um, which was a shame because I think um, that's kind of how I had advertised it for social media. That's how it was known. Um, but I do still have why, why a strong... Sorry. Um, so because I've changed institutions, there it was a little bit mm. tricky um, with keeping uh, naming and specifically. But I think with a lot of the relationships from the groups and from the amazing families um, that I came into contact with along those couple of years, um, then I've been able to keep in touch with them. So they're aware that I've um, moved to a different institute and that the research is still continuing. So I've had quite a bit of, um, I guess, follow-up and retention with some of the families. I think it's just remarkable just, like, the way that families have, like, um, responded and wanted to, like, participate in your work. Like, we're talking in the thousands. That's incredible. But then, you know, families wanting to meet with you and talk to you and, like, engage with you, you know, outside of that questionnaire, like you've clearly hit something there for, for families. Like, you know, there's this yearning and this urge to kind of, you know, want to have um, to a voice heard or just to talk to someone about, you know, what they're going through. Like, it's powerful stuff. Absolutely. And I definitely felt that power and I felt, um, I guess, of that, not that I had the power. I mean, that I felt the power <laughs> of that movement. Um, and um, I that connection of a lot of families a big theme was someone wants to listen to my story and they care um, and whether that translates into the numbers you get at the end of your research you're listening to it and you can use that to try and interpret what the numbers mean um, you can use it to do future research studies so out of that a lot of families said i've participated so i'm really interested in this but could you look at this instead so from that, really? I'm also yeah, I was able to get that lived experience interest in, hey, as families, we want people to look into this, to tell us more about it. So I've used that as a bit of a driver for um, more of my more recent um, research studies. Yeah, it's very powerful, isn't it? I think if I'd have seen that before, I'd have been putting my hand up for that one. I think it, when you're in this situation, like you said before, once you leave the NICU and you go off on your journey, I think there is that area where you are you feel like you're on your own going through that journey and not quite having the understanding as to why where how it's it's definitely an area that I think is being investigated more but there's definitely a lot more research that needs to come through from that and support for parents particularly very passionate about this area as you can tell <laughs> and it's, it's lovely well, that we've got a very shared commonality here <laughs> yeah. Um, and it's interesting too because I kind of find uh, like uh, it's kind of like overlap between I know you know before I met these guys you know it's that kind of like oh you know these issues or questions or things that I'm experiencing or seeing you know you know am I my own and I've kind of gone down this kind of convoluted kind of research pathway now because there were things that kind of really kind of stuck with me and I'm like I don't know how to explore this 
And so kind of just putting myself down that research pathway to kind of explore them myself from kind of that, that um, consumer lens because I was mm. like, yeah. But it's that it's clearly that the drive is still the same as this yearning for like, you know, um, mm. to, to, to have something that of, of, of interest or importance kind of um, explored further. Um, and Absolutely. you know, families are having that. You know, I'm, I'm guessing because families have that relationship or developing that relationship with you, they're now able to kind of communicate. You know, can you look at this or what about this? And I think that's love that idea. Just love it. Absolutely. And I think you know the key role of consumers and lived experience is that researchers, if they don't know what's important, if they don't know what the experience is like, they could be looking at something that doesn't matter to the families in terms of mm. the priorities for their life. Um, and then the research disappears out into the nether or out into the net and um, it doesn't get back to families and make that difference. And it can't be translated or there could be resistance in it being translated because yes. like, I have these priorities that I need to know, or I want to know for my family, for my child, but the research isn't sitting in that space. Um, so having consumers and having lived experience means that research is relevant. And I really, truly believe that for research to make a difference, it needs to be relevant and it needs to have that voice involved. Otherwise, there's people doing things that might not be relevant at all. Yeah, exactly, exactly. And I mean, we're hearing and more about the term, sorry, um, consumer-initiated research or consumer-driven research. And I think that's really, I mean, I don't really know what it, you know, I kind of struggle a little bit um, and Mel would agree with me just kind of like you know, what that looks like. But I don't know how to say it, but just for me, that's yeah, really it's important. It's not specifically yeah. the research, but we want to contribute to the priorities or what's being researched. I think that's where our value is. And I mean, what you've done is incredible because like this highlights how big a need long-term outcomes are for families and that we always say it goes beyond you know the NICU once you get discharged it kind of we escape that cocoon and now like em said we're on our own and you know we have to navigate that and we know that it's long term it doesn't end you know even at two and four when the follow-up's finished you know there's school there's you know primary school high school and all of that and you've actually validated that for families that this is mm. something that, that's really important and i think that's um incredible which is yeah thank you yeah. i was gonna ask a probably a silly question and we can cut it out if it is i was just curious there are no silly where, questions um, <laughs> you know how the twin to twin study how you were mm -hmm. saying the second twin um might have more challenges does that does it matter in terms of um, like the way that, that they were delivered? Like if it's a vaginal birth, different to like, because with a Caesar, how do they choose which one's first, which one's like, yeah, I'm just thinking if it's naturally one comes out and like the body kind of chooses, but in a cesarean situation that might be chosen medically, does it still have the same outcome? That's an excellent question. And that's a reason more than once and I really wish we had thought to ask about the delivery method. Um, okay. Retrospectively, I would have loved to have put that in, um, but that's something that we're definitely working into our upcoming um, twin studies that are looking at that first versus second um, birth order comparison. Mm -hmm. But um, I know that anecdotally, I can't give you the numbers and it won't be in the paper, but from the family emergency uh, cesarean sections and there were some natural uh, vaginal deliveries as well so I know that there was a mix in the sample somewhere um, the proportions I'm not sure of um, but it was a resounding difference for that first and second born risk um, and I know that some of our infants the second born didn't always correlate or stay the same as twin A and twin B so they weren't always the same. So what we looked at was um, entrance to the, to the world. Um, and so that didn't necessarily mean that they were twin A throughout the pregnancy or twin B 
um, throughout the pregnancy. So that is a little bit of a gray area that's still very ambiguous that I would love to tap into a little bit more um, because I think that could have implications for the way that C-sections are planned um, and whether we need to be a bit more aware of the twin A, twin B, first, second born um, orders and if they have different risks or experiences. Yeah. That's what happened to us. Like one was twin A, one was twin B, and then when they were born, it got mixed around. I guess. Yeah. Yeah. It was very confusing. I like to keep you on your toes. <laughs> yes. Yes. I mean, I like your approach in terms of it being like the holistic approach rather than looking at things in isolation. That it was kind of having a bigger picture in terms of their experience and their outcomes. Thank you. And I think even now, the three of you, I'm sure, have exceptionally vivid memories um, of your <laughs> birthing experiences and those early days. And I think it's been raised a couple of times in that there is the assumption that prematurity ends at two, um, as they say. But I think not just for the child, for the whole family, whether that's siblings of the child, whether they were born before or after um, the preterm born child, for the birthing parent, for um, any partners or other primary caregivers, for grandparents, um, there is a huge impact across the family system. Um, There's unfortunately not necessarily prioritised at this stage um, to explore. And when was the research published? Um, so this one, October for our preterm behavioural phenotype profiles. Um, and then a couple of months before that for the twin study. Um, for our parent study, it's been accepted um, in the Journal of Perinatology, but we're just waiting for it to reach um, the publish and the official button um, for it to be out into the world. Congratulations. Mm. Thank you. Thank you. That's fantastic. Well, hopefully early in the new year, perhaps it will be out or? I think so. I think quite a few people will be taking some extended breaks over this period. So I anticipate we'll see it in the new year um, sometime. And I'm curious from your research, like um, those families that were involved, was there any kind of um, uh, like follow up or update from them as to this is what's happened? Thanks for your participation. Or do they know where to come visit? Like, is there a, a website that they can come visit if they want to go, oh, I wonder what happened to that um, research I was involved in? Absolutely. So once um, each of the individual papers have been published so far, we've shared it on our social media, which I made sure was linked in all of the other social media posts in an inception of social media use. Um, and so a lot of um, the people who or families who had participated came along and followed um, my research page as well. So they would have seen it there. Once all three of them have been published, so the entirety of the Nurturing Champs trilogy um, studies, then I'll be emailing all of the papers to the contact numbers for those who wanted to be sent them. Um, but instead of sending each one, I thought I'd wait until we had all three um, in collection rather than adding to the burden that a lot of families have already. Well, that's yeah, really that's fantastic. Be contacting. Yeah. Yeah. But I hadn't thought about that with the research projects because some of them were a credit accounts. So some of the research that we're involved in, they had Twitter accounts and things like that, but not necessarily that we're marketing that or, you know, making that available as an option to the families or the participants in that trial to say, here's a way to stay in touch with the trial. Um, like, I think that's really fantastic mm -hmm. that it just keeps them engaged in the loop and, and updated. And one of the things that families do want is to know the results, to know that their contribution has made a difference. So that I've just written that down. That's really great. It's something to remember on how we can engage and keep families in the loop. Yeah, it's really good. Thank you. Uh, yeah, I remember being a child participant in a couple of research studies when I was younger um, that mum had signed me up for. And I get these moments every now and then where I wonder what happened to that. I, I have no idea where that went, if it's been published and what they found. Um, so yeah. I think even if it's not an immediate 
desire for families to know, I think it's nice for them to have the option and a way to find it um, if they ever choose that they would like to. Yeah. No, it's yeah. Not. Sorry, I'm sorry about this. I'm distracted because I have a small child that's climbing underneath the table as we're talking. So sorry. Do you want to say hello? Absolutely no problem. Do you want to say hello, Alfie? Do you want to just Alfie. put your head in and wave? No, no, camera shy. By the looks of it, so sorry. <laughs> School holidays started today. Oh uh, yeah, no. Really Day it's one all about them. Holidays. We love that they're, they're included. <laughs> Absolutely, we can't be here without them. I know. What happens, um, what happens next, Grace? Like, where does the research go? Like, how does what you're, mm. I guess, discovered or what's come about, how does that benefit family? Like, how do we put that into practice? Absolutely. So I am currently working with a couple of um, existing collaborations and some new ones um, on designing some, I guess, psychology-based interventions. Um, which will hopefully help, um, particularly for the parent study at this stage, um, because I think a lot of the parents, um, and this came across quite strongly in our conversations, will prioritise their children. And so it's very rare, um, I've found, for many parents to prioritise themselves unless things have gotten quite severe or they're really bad. Um, but I definitely think these new interventions we're trying to work towards will be more of a, I guess, a mental health buffer or a booster, I guess, rather than intense and severe psychological treatment. It will be more of a, hey, here are some really easy exercises that you can do even while you're, I don't know, unpacking the dishwasher or we've got bath and bedtime with the kids. Just really simple things that you can do while you're doing other things um, that can help with general psychological health. Um, and we're trying to make these accessible um, and I guess not time intensive as well as free. So we're trying to make them as available as we can. Um, so I think that's the next step for where we're going um, with some of these findings. You just mentioned free, how would it be funded? We're definitely trying to get funding um, from, from some external bodies. Um, but in saying that, we've been very fortunate that collectively um, with the team, we do have quite a few resources already pulled together. And at this mm -hmm. stage, we're in the process of seeing how we can bring it together and what gaps we then might need funding um, for. And that would be a national resource? I'm hoping so. I'm hoping yeah. so. Amazing. Yeah. I like that idea because then for parents, it's not, you don't think about it as like, oh, it's another thing I need to do or another thing I have to shell up money for. It's something that I can kind of do as part of my day and, you know, kind of, mm. kind of seamlessly kind of pop in as opposed to just another thing I have to hold on to to consider doing. Um, Absolutely. And it means that you don't with. have to get the family into the car and go to somewhere, you know, for eight weeks in a row at this set time, um, mm. which is quite unfeasible for families to do. Um, and so we're hoping that it can be, hey, you can sign in, you can have a look if you happen to have the time, or you could just read through it in the first go once you get access to it. And it will be those strategies that can really target those thoughts of, oh, I didn't do that today, I've done a terrible job or I should be doing this better, why am I feeling so stressed? Um, my children should have had, I don't know, a more healthy lunch or something today. Um, those voices that we get that put ourselves down um, is really where we're trying to target um, some of that more uplifting and empowering um, internal speech. That's fabulous. And it's great hearing about your research paper as well, from my perspective, obviously we're navigating through like di uh, dyslexia um, mm -hmm. and ADHD at the moment. So it's, it's very interesting to let that, that post-discharge piece that you didn't even consider when you were in there at the time. So Absolutely. Yeah. Like, when you're sitting in the NICU, <laughs> you don't think, wow, I'm going to have to trudge through a bucket ton of referrals and appointments when they're nine. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. and trying to find people to it's an interesting one on the dyslexia piece at the moment I've realized there's a wait list as long as your arm 
it costs oh, an absolute wow. uh, yeah and it costs an absolute fortune to get M oh. mls tutors um so i spoke mm -hmm. to one yesterday and she's like i've got a wait list for 12 months and then i spoke to the dyslexia learning center who has a wait list of 18 of 12 to 18 months and then they were like, when you do do it, it's $130 a session. And we recommend two sessions a week. And I'm like, oh, my God. <laughs> oh, yeah. no. Yeah. And that's yeah. ridiculous. When the wait list yeah. is that long, like, you know. What do you do, right? Yeah. 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 Anyway, that's just my, that was yesterday. We're always, so. we're, we're always talking about early intervention, but you know that you need the intervention and they're still pushing it out. Like, that's. Yeah, so this is why it really interests me. But yeah, that post discharge piece of right, you've, you've now got to work it out and navigate through. Social media is brilliant because you can find different groups and resources and other people to chat to. But yeah, it's it's a really interesting research paper that you've you've done. So I'm yeah, it's, mm. it's thank you. And for people people that are going through the journey to know that they're not the only ones. Like Nat was saying before, is like you know, is it commonality? Nat and I've had conversations about our boys and mm. all that kind of yeah. thing. So it's quite cathartic to have a chat with somebody else, knowing that you're not the only one. Yeah, definitely, absolutely. And I think that opens up and takes away a lot of the shame as well. I know that yeah. particularly. Yeah for birthing parents for prematurity and, and other high risk um, birth events. It's like, why did, why didn't my body hold on until, until that yeah. date or until yeah. we got to term and there's that level of blame mm. that, that can be felt. And that's so pervasive and it takes over so much of your thoughts and feelings. And then when something crops up five years later, it's like, is this because of that? Or is this, down to me it's not for those of you nodding um <laughs> you didn't do anything it's not your fault um but yeah i think it, it there's not enough support for families in those transitions to find out and a lot of practitioners i'm sure there's some fantastic ones but a lot of them don't recognize long-term outcomes of prematurity um, and so a lot of difficulties after preterm birth can be different to term children and so they get missed or they get dis dismissed which is even worse yeah. <laughs> yeah 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 do you oh, think yeah. one of the reasons when you're in the NICU is because obviously like the taking care of you or the doctors like they're neonatologists once you get discharged you then go into the hands of a pediatrician like that particular doctor that's with you in the NICU is not following like those mm. children long term so their focus is there and it's hard to, I guess, look beyond or be able to share that a lot of that experience because I, I remember asking, you know, what's the lungs going to be like and all of those long-term questions. Mm -hmm. um, how does that happen? And then I was thinking about what you had just said, Em. So what information would you have wanted while you are in hospital about how Alfie's going to be at nine? Oh, like, would, would you have yeah. been able to, Oh, yeah. I, I think for me, like, yeah, I think I would have been, for me, I think it would have been understanding there could be, because you, 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 A, Alfie had a congenital issue, which I wasn't aware of what the consequences were on that, because again, it was keeping him alive. So I would like a little bit of this is what you need to do in relation to this. And I think longer term, I think I would have liked to understand what some of those challenges could be. So at least you can look and identify it. And our paediatrician was really good, actually, to be fair, because we were in and out of hospital for about three years. Mm -hmm. And we did the testing when we left, so the preschool one. And there was an area that he, he's so super smart in certain areas, but then from a memory perspective, he couldn't remember things. Mm -hmm. And he's like, that could be an indicator of ADHD. And I was like, oh, no, he just wasn't paying attention. But he monitored it through. So he helped us. Mm. We were really lucky with who we had. So he was like, he planted the seed. So then we were looking out for it. So I think leaving NICU, I think having an idea of maybe what to look for. And it's not just a toddler or things like that would have been really, really helpful for me, I think. Mm. And not it's almost like a, we need that first appointment with the paediatrician rather just to ask questions rather than yeah. in NICU. Yeah, I think so, actually. I think yeah. if you've got a good ped, yeah. and ours is fabulous, but we only found him when we were going in and out of the, the kids' hospitals, not when we were discharged from yeah. NICU. So maybe a connection through to a paediatrician that has experience with premier kids would be yeah. 
that would be the number one thing I think would have been the best thing that I could have asked for post-discharge because they don't give you any recommendations so um yeah yeah and the wait list for pediatricians now on the beaches is ridiculous as well so we were just really lucky we got in when we did but um yeah so I think that's probably the key right and even the nurses like I had to go to three in our local area before I found one who had any kind of knowledge of a premature baby rather than you know a mainstream full-term baby that there might be additional issues um, and that was me going through GPs or even the chemist could the chemist recommend someone um, you know that was a community nurse so yeah there's kind of like that big knowledge gap even with the medical professionals and we've spoken before particularly speaking to adult friends so we know that you know it, it's lifelong for, for these babies um, as they grow that yeah like they struggle talking to a GP that might understand their issues or even want to piece that puzzle together that what they have you know what's happening in late teens or early adulthood may be related to the fact that they were born so early. I think I had a GP once ago, I mean, he's not premature anymore, is he? And it's just like, mate, like, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's not, and I'm like, he's old. You didn't make yeah. all those weeks anywhere. <laughs> no, no, the 12 weeks that we lost, right? Um, but he was like, he said something like that. He's like, well, he's passed, you know, he's in actual age, no, not corrected. I said, so, yes, I understand that. But the consequences of being preterm and having a congenital issue meant that we had a lot of complications and it isn't just a mm-hmm. bit, it's a little bit more, but it was it was just like oh my god did you actually oh that's know? so frustrating <laughs> oh anyway and then i'm just curious like what's your next um focus after all of this like it just it, i mean it sounds huge but you just sound like you've got a lot of kind of drive to kind of um i suspect there's a long list of things you want to approach as well there is i am known to be overly enthusiastic um <laughs> which can lead to overcommitment, but it's all things that I'm very passionate about doing. Um, So I guess aside from that, um, with research wise, delving a little bit more into that multiple birth space is something that um, I'm trying to do, particularly with research students. Um, Outside of research, I've got a black belt grading tomorrow, actually, that I'm (laughs) preparing for. So that's my next big out of work thing that I'm doing. Um, yeah, <laughs> that's is, is there a board break involved or some kind of breaking of something? Um, I have to do four board breaks um, and then a number of other things. So there'll be quite a few. Good luck. That's amazing. <laughs> Thank you. Well, I think I can speak on behalf of all the family that we think that you're amazing and it's been such a I think a gift to families that you fell into this space that you know came mm. upon you and um we are definitely glad that you found some passion here because you're making such a huge difference it's incredible oh thank you so, yeah. I, uh, it means a lot to me to hear and i am also really glad that the opportunity presented itself um i don't mm. see if it hadn't have happened i don't see myself having made my way here um, so I'm really grateful that it did. And I think I'll be in this space for a very long time. Well, we're going to have all the ways that people can find you in the notes for this episode, but where is the easiest way for someone to, to find, find you, Grace? Ooh, I think out of the avenues, if we're looking for, or if you're looking for papers, Um, or a little bit more about my academic position, then the University of Tasmania staff profile is probably the best place. Um, If you would like to be in the social media sphere, I think Instagram is probably the the easiest option to find me. We'll definitely include all that so people can find you. Is there anything else that you want to share with us before we wrap up? Um, Nothing else about me. I think I've talked far too much about myself already. Um, but I I think there might be a few families who participated in Nurturing Chance that get to see this. Um, so I would like to say any, a humongous thank you. Um, the research, my PhD, and so many experience that I've been able to have since starting my PhD wouldn't have been possible without families who contributed to the research and the amazing groups and advocates and consumers 
who shared it around and actually made it possible. So um, just my gratitude to everyone who was involved and who may be involved in the future. That's unreal. Well, it's been amazing. We got to the end of the year, but we still got to speak to you. <laughs> so I think I know. We nearly, it nearly got pushed to the new year, so I'm glad that we were able to secure it in 2023. Yeah. Closing out the year and what a great way to close it out as well. So thank you so much. Thank you both for all three of you for your time as well. Well, when we have new updates, we'd love to have you back on so that we can keep sharing the work that you're doing. It's incredible. Absolutely. I would love to chat again. All right. So thank thank you so much. Thanks. Thank you so much. Bye. That's a wrap on another episode of the NICU Live Network. Thanks for joining us today. To stay connected, please make sure you're following us on social media. And if you found value in this episode, please share, like, or comment. We'll see you on the next episode.